Hear us from heaven. Hear us from heaven. Hear us from heaven. And hear us from heaven. Hear us from heaven. Hear us from heaven. us from heaven hear us from heaven hear us from heaven one more time hear us hear us from heaven hear us from heaven hear us from heaven open the blind eyes Unlock the deaf ears and come to your people as we draw near God and hear us from heaven and touch our generation. We are your people crying out in desperation. Give God some praise in this place because He's so worthy. He's so awesome. Oh, yes. Amen, amen. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Colton, would you lead us in prayer before we preach the word today? Heavenly Father, as we come before you, I thank you so much for the wonderful blessings that you've bestowed upon every individual in this building and everyone that you just continue to bless during the weeks, God. Lord, we pray that as our praises go up, that our ears become open to hear what you have to say through our pastor this morning. This divine word and divine appointment that you've given him to give us the word that you have. And Lord, I pray that we are receptive of every bit of it, that we take it and we hide it in our hearts and we take it and we apply it to our lives within the weeks that come after. And Lord, we give you the glory and honor for everything that you're doing here and in everyone's lives and in this ministry, God. We can claim blessings upon everyone in this place. We claim blessings over this ministry, Lord. We claim growth over this ministry in the name of Jesus. Lord, this is your divine appointment. This is your divine place. And we welcome you here. Move us out of the way and enter in, God. Let your word be spoken like a two-edged sword. And we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is here, church. The Lord's here, church. Amen. Children, you're welcome to go to Children's Church. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I would have to say wow at how the Lord's been talking to us lately. Wow. I'm amazed at the amount of instruction prophetic word tongues and interpretation that God has been directing our way and we if uh, God wills it will finish this series on if my people by tonight got some really good things I want to share this evening but today I want to uh, talk for just a few minutes about the thought of heaven and I purposely had them to sing this song this morning hear us from heaven because it is right in line with what I'll be preaching this morning. Second Chronicles 7.14, most of you have probably memorized this by now, so let's read it all together. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Wow. He said, I'll hear from heaven. Knowing me, as many of you do, I'm not satisfied just to read an English word and move on. I like to dig. I want to pull out the shovel, the spade, get my feet in the dirt, and dig a little deeper, and I looked into that word here. It came from a Hebrew word, shama. And as you look at the definition of here, it means to hear with attention and with interest. Now, I hope I'm not about to get anyone in this room in trouble with what I'm about to ask. But I wonder if you are in a relationship or have been where sometimes you question if the person is listening to you or not. 
uh, I won't name names, but during praise band practice today, we had a quick little 20-second conversation about someone who doesn't listen to someone else. And uh, I told them, I said, I believe that's in all relationships because I hear that from many people. Thank you, brother. Um, it's important that when we talk that people are attentive to us. When God instructed Solomon to have the people turn and look to heaven, turn toward Jerusalem and to offer up their prayers, sincere prayers of repentance, prayers of conviction, humbling themselves, he said, don't worry because you can know your Father in heaven will be attentive. I will be listening to you. That's what God was trying to tell us. I want to give you some famous quotes about listening. This was anonymous. It says, history repeats itself because no one listens the first time. <laughs> this guy's got a doozy of a name, Tom Pacherik. He said, boredom is having to listen to someone talk about himself when you really want to talk about yourself. Franklin P. Jones said, one advantage of talking to yourself is that you at least know someone is listening. <laughs> Will Rogers said Congress is so strange. A man gets up to speak and says nothing, nobody listens, and then everybody disagrees with him. And then Dorothy Sarnoff said, make sure you have finished speaking before your audience has finished listening. And that's very true. Uh, there are times where that no matter what position you hold, if you speak to others, sometimes you think, boy, I, I better be careful not go too far because I've lost my audience. So a speaker has to know his or her audience. God excitedly waits for your prayers every day. Every single day of your life, God is anxiously waiting. He's saying, what are they going to say today? He's, he's waiting to see what your free will will direct you to do. He's saying, I'm ready to hear your prayers. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. You are not wasting time, church, when you pray. I will admit to you that I have prayed for over 30 years to this God that we serve, the only God. And I will tell you that within those 30 years, there have been many prayers I have prayed that were a formality. Prayers that I memorized certain words and didn't even realize it. It wasn't taught to me. Prayers such as, Heavenly Father, I love you with all my heart. Show me your will. I'll do whatever you ask me to do today. God, point me in certain directions. And, and I found myself getting caught in cycles where that I became so familiar with certain words that I said them without feeling them. And so even as a pastor, I have to guard myself. When I come here during the week and I pray, especially on Saturday nights as I pray for you and I pray for the services that we're going to enter into, I have to make sure and shake myself so that I do not get caught up and repetition, and things that just sound right. And many times when I stop and I begin to think about who I'm really talking to, it actually changes what I say when I pray. And you see, that's where we have to get as Christians. We have to realize who we are talking to. I don't know the number of times I have said that phrase from behind this pulpit, that you need to know who you are talking to. And I want to go a little deeper here this morning because God wanted to let Solomon know who they were praying to. And I find it interesting that God didn't say that I will hear your prayers, and then he moved on to the next sentence. He didn't do that. He added something. He said, then I will hear from heaven. He said, wait a minute. Why was it so important? If God said it, there had to be significance. Well, I want to point out several reasons today why I believe God said the words that he would hear from heaven. I'm going to be uh, transparent with you just like I believe you would be with me. I don't give my home number out to everybody. I don't give my address to everybody because I'm one of those. And now listen, everybody's different, Brother Richard. I understand. Some people love people popping in their house nonstop. My uncle was like that, uh, Uncle Dexter, Aunt Donna, Jeffers. He passed on in 1990. Every time we'd come stay at their house, you could, you could guarantee there could be at least two different church members that would pop in, ring the doorbell, and, oh, there's so-and-so, and there's so-and-so. I won't say their name. But there's so-and-so, and you just knew they was going to come by and see them. I thought, well, that's awesome. I mean, we all had a good time. I'm one of those people. I'm a little more private. You compare me to my dad, you'll see two totally different people. 
We were at General Assembly this past year, and I think he met 14,000 people. I might have met 10. He's like that. He wants to talk to every person that he sees and makes a friend, and he'll say, Knight's my name. Some people call me uh, Pastor Knight, Brother Knight, and others, Oh, Holy Knight. He, he always throws that in there. He does not meet a stranger. You'll see him in town. He's the same way. I'm a little more reserved. I'm glad that God is not reserved. God says, I'm going to, Solomon, I'm going to give you my home telephone number. I'm going to give you my email address. I'm going to give you my home address. When you come after me, when you seek my face, he says, I want you to come where I stay. Your prayers will be heard at my house. In other words, God has given us his home telephone number, and he says, call me anytime I stay up all night anyway. Anytime you need God, he has given you a direct line to his house. He said, I will hear from heaven. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. Who is this God that we're talking about? One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Let's go to Psalm 95, verse 3. Psalm 95, verse 3 says, For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. I like to know when I root for a team that my team's better than your team, that my team's better than any other team. We've been able to say that quite a bit as Alabama fans here in the last few years. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> don't get cocky, Pastor. Amen. Hey, don't, trust me, I've been through the lean years too. Amen. <coughs> Mike Shula, anybody? Anyway, been through some tough times. I like to be able to root for a team that is undefeated, that is almost invincible. I know none of them really are, but they have all the elements needed to win a championship. When we come together every Sunday and every Wednesday and we celebrate our king, we celebrate a God who is still undefeated and always will be. Amen. We serve a God who cannot be kicked off his property. He doesn't have to worry about owing back taxes or property taxes or, or worry about eminent domain where the, some governor is going to fly through the universe and say, oh, by the way, God, it's time for, you're going to have to move out. We're taking heaven for something else. I'm thankful that our God is king over everybody. Amen. That's the God you serve. It says he's the king above all gods. I can just imagine when this hit the headlines during David's time when he ruled in Israel and, and the word got out, man, David said that God is king of all gods. There were probably some uh, Baal worshipers who got a little offended. There was probably those who had a little astra pole in the backyard that uh, was hidden under a, a sack, and they, they got offended because he said he's, God's the king of all gods. I would imagine there were some who served Chemosh, and they would cause their children to pass through the fire, uh, crazy stuff, just to please this God who didn't really exist. And I bet they got offended, Brother Colton, when David said he was the king of all gods, none other but Jehovah. Church, let me tell you right now that there's going to be people in America, believe it or not, who will be offended when we say that Jesus is Lord of all, that there is no other name given uh, by men under, under heaven, by men where that uh, men must be saved. There is no other name except for the name of Jesus Christ. People will still be offended today, just like they were in David's day, but David didn't care. He said, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not worried about who it offends. I'm concerned about who it will change. Amen. And so today in this world, church of the living God, I commission you to boldly pronounce yet with love that there is no other God except Jesus Christ. He is Lord. The prophet Isaiah grabbed the headlines of every newspaper in Judah with these words. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. God was telling Solomon as he instructed him, he said, I'll hear from heaven, that you could not dial an international number to reach him. There was not a cell phone with strong enough service to touch heaven. There was not enough, there were not enough stamps you could put on an envelope to reach heaven's gates. God was in heaven. We are on earth. And he was saying, if you're wanting to really reach me, church, he said, it's only going to happen through prayer. Jesus instructed us in the New Testament, and he added something, an asterisk to that. 
He said that whatever you ask in my name. So Jesus told us after he came to earth, he said that now not only will you pray to God, but he says you're going to pray through my name, and God will hear you when you pray. I want to go to a picture on the screen of heaven. I believe that's next. As God unveiled more of the mysteries concerning heaven. Uh, don't guess it'll be up there. I'm sorry. We discover that there are streets of gold, gates of pearl. There's a river of life. There are saints of God who have gone on before us. Amen. Do any of you know anyone that's up there right now? Say, so we talk about people in past tense, but they're more present than we are. They are absent from the body, but they are present with the Lord. Amen. There's a great throne up in heaven that God sits upon, and the Bible tells us that he is surrounded by a rainbow. I think that it's not by chance that Satan instigates the homosexual LGBT movement to adopt a rainbow as their color scheme because the devil himself used to hang out around God's throne, and he knows that the rainbow was very important to the Father. So he thought, I'll distort this movement, and I'll uh, take something that was meant for holiness and meant for beauty around the throne of God, and I'll stamp it upon a movement that is against nature itself and definitely defiant of the Creator. So we see that there are many things in the hidden agenda of Satan. But in heaven we also find there are angels who encircle the throne constantly proclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. You know, the next time the enemy comes to you and starts tempting you or making fun of you for what you believe, why don't you remind him, hey, devil, remember, you used to be up there too. You used to be around that throne bowing to the same God that I bow to. I've just got enough sense to keep serving him where you didn't. Can I get an amen? Let the devil know that he's the one missing out. There's many people who have died in flesh, and they have risen as far as in their spirit man, and been lifted up to heaven. Some of them uh, that have passed on were allowed to come back. There are people who have shared testimonials that said, I, was, I left my body. Maybe they died for just a few short minutes, and people were working on them in the hospital, and God allowed their soul to come back into their body. I've read books. I've watched videos. I've heard eyewitnesses, people who talk to me. And there are many interesting things that I have heard, some of them being that they saw people and they knew those people, but everyone they saw was young, as in 20 to 30 years old in appearance. No one was crippled. There were no sick folks. No one was old. They were able to move and to uh, uh, act as if they were in their 20s as far as their energy level. I've Read stories, and there was a lady who wrote a book called A Divine Revelation of Heaven. She also wrote A Divine Revelation of Hell. Her name's Mary Baxter. I recommend you reading those books if you ever have a chance. You'll be very enlightened. But one thing that uh, she talked about was when she walked through the place of heaven, she said there is a city. There's also like a planet of heaven where it's, it's very similar to earth. She talked about trees and grass. And I was amazed when she shared this because another man, uh, years later, shared the same type of experience. She said as she walked through the grass that the flowers would open up and begin singing praises to God. Melodious sounds, uh, harmony. Uh, you'd have three, four flowers just bust out in a quartet. Can I get an amen? There was uh, flowers that opened up tulips and roses, and they would lift up the name of Jesus Christ. She said as she would walk by, she noticed that along the stem of every a blade of grass, or along every blade of grass, it looked like diamonds were enwrapped with the greenery of the grass. It was gorgeous. And as she said, there was no way to adequately describe what she saw. There were animals there. Now, I'm not saying if you lost your pu puppy brownie, that brownie will come up to you and meet you at the gates of pearl. But I will say there are animals that are in heaven. We know that when Jesus comes back to rule the earth and we come with him, we're guaranteed we'll be riding on white horses. Amen? So there are animals in heaven. What else is up there? Many people have described that communication is different in heaven than it is on earth. 
that we vocalize thought, that we speak from our mouths using our voice box to pr produce sound, and that those sounds, uh, we form languages. But many people who have been to heaven and return said that there wasn't that type of communication, but it was more like a thought. Now, I have been hindered at times, even while preaching, because I'm trying to transfer a thought here into a thought in your mind, and I have to use as many colorful words as possible to accomplish that, but it's hard. But in heaven, you don't have to sit there for 10 minutes and try to describe what you felt at that concert you went to back in 1983. You don't have to sit there and say 13 paragraphs to describe how you feel about something. You can take your thoughts and project them to another person, and they, it will almost be as if they experienced that themselves. I get frustrated, Brother Neil, when I try to describe to people how to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It frustrates me because I take all these words in English and I'll say, just praise the Lord. Just lift up your hands. Submit yourself to him. Ask God to baptize you. The gift is for you. And, and there'll be people who will just seek and seek for 30 minutes, for an hour. And I'm thinking, Lord, would you please help me to project what I'm feeling and what I know into them? And it's difficult. I feel so restrained by language. But in heaven, there will not be that restraint. I believe in heaven that God will be able to speak to every single one of you at the same time. I know that we've seen paintings and we've heard stories of folks lined up for about a million years and finally your number's called number 463,226,000. God's ready for you. It's only been 13,000 years you've been st standing there in line. I don't believe for a second heaven's going to be like that. You know why? Because right now on earth, we're not even in heaven with him, and yet he can speak to every single person on the planet instantly at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's no server that can handle that kind of memory. There's no computer technology that can handle a hard drive to hold that much. They say somewhere out in, I think, Nevada, the, um, oh, boy, I always forget the name. It's like an N, N something A. Some of y'all might can help me, but it's like an intelligence agency. Um, they collect cell phone usage um, as far as what people say on their cell phones and the Internet usage. They collect all that, and they say it's strictly to counter terrorism, but sometimes if the wrong person controls it, they could uh, impact a lot of other things. But no computer, supercomputer, is strong enough to handle the the communication that God has every second of the day. It's fascinating. And I believe that any time that you want an audience with the king, God will be able to communicate with you one-on-one. -on -one. That's heaven, folks. Mary Baxter, who I mentioned that wrote A Divine Revelation of Heaven, she said that there was an instant when she was in heaven that an angel looked at her and said, I want to take you and show you what things are like on earth when someone is saved. And she was thinking, oh boy, let's go. And they took her instantly into a, a church. I don't remember where it was, but as they entered the building, she said she looked around and there were people, but she said, man, I saw angels all over the place. There was one over in that corner, one on the stage, and there was one at the front door. She said there was a huge angel on top of the church who managed all of the smaller, or, or maybe they weren't quite as powerful, angels. And as I read this, Brother Ricky, I started thinking, man, I wonder what New Haven looks like. I wonder if there are some demons hanging out on Cedar Bend Road, or if there's some devils on Anchor Drive, and they realize every time New Haven gets together and you see a torch of fire shoot up toward the heavens of the Holy Ghost that they look and say oh no there's those saints of God getting together again oh no bro there comes those uh, guardian angels and those angelic hosts once again I guess New Haven's having church today she said as she was there in the spirit no one could see her and she looked around and you'll find this a little interesting there was one angel who was keeping record writing things down we know based on Old Testament scripture, I don't have it on me right now, but that God keeps a record in his books of things that we do. And this angel was recording as the offering was being taken up, who gave what? That's odd, isn't it? Now, now don't get me wrong. He's not just saying, well, that and gave two bucks and that and gave 20. This angel recorded the type of attitude the person had when they gave say well pastor I don't have a lot of money but trust me when I say this that if you'll just put a quarter in offering if you'll just put 50 cents if you if you don't hardly have anything if you'll just throw a quarter in there if you do it with the right spirit I believe that God's keeping a record of your heart amen 
as people were giving in the offering, a man walked in as she was seeing all this. And he was wrapped in strong bands, B-A-N-D-S. Uh, they looked like metal, very strong on him. And she knew that represented strongholds. And as he walked up to the altar and he fell on his knees, he began to confess his sins. He says, I've got to give my heart to God. And this was the main thing the angel was wanting to show Mary Baxter. And as he began praying, she saw that angel reach out and he would confess his, the man would confess his sins and the angel would take his finger and touch one of those huge thick bands. And it was like fire came out of the angel's finger and melted the band and it fell to the floor. And the man confessed another sin and he touched another band and it fell to the floor and he confessed another sin and same thing happened. And the man stood up and lifted up his hands realizing he was free. And somehow God allowed her to see inside his body and she said that the heart was black but as he released everything to God that God caused it to turn into a crimson beautiful red color. God made a heart from stone into flesh that's what our God's capable of heaven John chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 Jesus said in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also Sister Laura, what's one thing you wouldn't mind having in your mansion? A lion. A lion? And we know it won't hurt her up there. India, what, what are you thinking as far as heaven? A grand piano. Oh, come on. Grand piano. I had that on my list, on my paper. I'm like, Lord, I'm going to have a big old room with a grand piano. What would y'all like in heaven? <laughs> Whatever your wife wants. All right. Bro, you got any ideas of something you'd like? Softball field, all right. Anybody else in here, you got a thought? Say, oh, I, I, I want this in my mansion. Y'all got any thoughts? Uh-oh, Brother David. Sound system. Oh, sound system. So when you're living on um, the corner of holy and righteousness, you're going to hear a, a surround sound system uh, booming, and you're going to know that's where David's house is. Amen. He's going to be jamming for Jesus. Any thoughts over here? Bowling on streets of gold. There'll probably be one little bitty angel setting up the pins. Amen. Anybody else? What would you? Fishing with a golden rod. <laughs> Fishing with a golden rod. Ooh. Fishing with a golden rod. Well, India got one of my things I had written down, the grand piano. I've thought, too, about what I would like. I wouldn't mind being able to look out the uh, window of my mansion and seeing a metropolis. I told my wife last night, I said, I just wonder if I'm supposed to live in the city because I am in love with huge city landscapes and the, the night lights. I just love it. I love it. I told her I am going to get some kind of big poster on one of my walls at work or somewhere that makes me feel like I'm in New York. I, said, I just I love every movie I watch with that. I love it. So anyway, everybody's a little different. Some people like looking out and seeing the beach. Some like seeing the country and horses running. Uh, I believe that God will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Um, I'm hoping for unlimited, well, let's just say this. I need a faucet up there that when you turn it on, it is nonstop, ice cold, Dr. Pepper. Woo! Won't make you gain weight up in heaven. Hallelujah. I wouldn't mind having milkshakes at any time. Whatever kind I want, strawberry shortcake, milkshake. I like Jack's apple pie a la mode milkshakes. They take actual apple pies and they blend them into uh, vanilla ice cream and it'll knock you off your seat. Good stuff. Um, a lot of things I imagine have to do with food. I wouldn't mind a good lazy boy recliner. There are some people who need a, a fabulous pristine kitchen uh, in their heavenly mansion because they love to cook. Amen. There's going to be a lot of great things when you get to glory. And Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place, and he added two words, for you. Now, what Jake said a moment ago kind of made me think of Jesus. Because I asked him, what would you want in heaven? He said, whatever she wants. Talking about Jade. 
I believe Jesus is that way about his bride. I believe he looks at us, regardless of gender right now, physically, that we are the bride of Christ. And Jesus is saying, Father, whatever they want is what I want in, in their place. However they want, I'll tell you right now, I could live in an apartment and be happy. But my wife likes a house. She likes room. She likes a sewing room. And <clears throat> we still haven't got the size bathroom she wants because one day she's wanting one of them. It's got the big separated shower and the jacuzzi tub. Two toilets, hallelujah, and two sinks. <clears throat> Amen for two sinks. I, I'm, I'm just, I don't really care. I can get by in the small cubicle. Uh, we're all built different. But I believe that just as I do my best to please my wife and when she says we need this, need that, I try to, to do that. I believe Jesus is looking at his bride right now that way and he's saying, Father, I know the desire of their heart. So let's add this to Rachel and Jeremy's match and let's add this to Alyssa's match and let's add this to uh, William Lawrence's match. I believe Jesus loves us that much. Revelation chapter 21, verses 4 through 6. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor, excuse me, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new new my question is is there anything in your life today that you wish God would make new have you ever been so broken by life that you said man I wish God would just come down in my room and and fix this think about that you ever had high hopes for something in your life and I mean dreams and goals and and maybe uh, your health got slammed it knocked you back about a couple years, things, something you didn't expect. Maybe you broke a limb or maybe you got cancer or maybe you had heart trouble or, or asthma or so, something physical happened. And you said, I wish God would make me new. You know, sometimes he does that in this life. He makes all things new. But I can promise you this, church, there will come a day where everything's going to be made new. I don't know that Brother Jim Thompson will ever skate and put on, uh, you know, what's them single rollerblade things? <coughs> inline skates? Isn't that what they call? I don't know if Brother Jim will ever t put on inline skates and skate across this floor <laughs> before Jesus comes. But I guarantee you, when you get to heaven, Brother Jim, you'll be able to do that. Amen? I don't always get what I want on this earth, and neither do you. But God says, this is not your heaven. This is not the final destination that I promised. This is not the place where I told you everything would be perfect. He said, I've got, I've got a place I'm preparing for you like that. So are you willing, bride, to trust the bridegroom while he's not doing everything you ask for a short time? Are you willing to trust in a God, a bridegroom that you have never seen face to face, that he actually does exist and he loves you so much that if you'll just hold out just a little longer, if you'll hold on a little longer in faith, that he'll give you all the desires of your heart. Think about that. Are you willing to wait for Jesus? <clears throat> he said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely, to him who thirst. Is there anyone in this room that has a tendency to think bigger than your budget? Yeah, most everybody. You ever make plans and people look at you and say, man, that ain't ever going to happen. You know, I've set a goal. I told the Lord again last night while I was walking these aisles. I said, God, I'm counting on it, 10 million people. 10 million people to win that many to... Um, to enter in your kingdom. I'm claiming 10 million souls. I'll tell you right now, that's thinking big when you're in a town of 8,000 people. Amen? And the biggest crowd you've ever preached to at one time is probably about 350. 10 million is a big number. 
We think big because our God thinks big. I can prove that just by looking at the city in heaven, the New Jerusalem. I want to look at, uh, he describes it in the book of Revelation. We won't go to all the scripture, but I'll just give you the stats here. The city alone is 1,500 miles square. That means wide, deep, uh uh-oh, look out, and tall. I started doing a little research into this. The distance of 1,500 miles, just to give you an idea of how big the city is, it would reach from New Mexico to Georgia. And that's just the city, not counting heaven itself. I thought, well, how tall is 1,500 miles? Just to get an idea. Have any of you ever been to New York? Has anyone ever seen the Empire State Building in person? Anybody from little little south side Alabama? (laughs) All right, we've got a few in here. If you were to take the Empire State Building, I'm telling you right now, if you were to stand at the foot of it and try to look up to the top, it would make you almost fall back. It's huge. Heaven itself would hold 5,447 Empire State Buildings stacked on top of one another. <laughs> don't tell me God don't think big. 5,447 Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other just to reach the top of the city of God. Wow. If you took every human being who had ever been born, and I know everyone didn't go to heaven. Matter of fact, most people, wide is the uh, way that leads to destruction. Most people don't. But if every human that had ever been born were to make it to heaven, they would only fill one small corner of that city. Isn't that amazing? We serve a God who thinks big. As we understand where God lives, we can understand more that he's capable of doing everything that we would ask or think according to his will. See, so many times we get caught up in life and we see our problems and we see our challenges and we say, well, that's just going to be tough. But when we back up and begin realizing, God, I need to interject you in the equation. I need to seek your counsel first. I need to discern your will initially and when we do this we're able to see greater things accomplished in our lives psalm 33 verse 18 behold the eye of the lord is on those who fear him on those who hope in his mercy then psalm 34 17 the righteous cry out and the lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles I want to leave you with this before we change over our service to take in new members. That God is listening to your prayers. You're not in some relationship with your Heavenly Father where he just blows you off half the time or he says, oh, I got got a prayer coming in from the Pope or I got one coming in from the general overseer of the Church of God. I'm going to have to put you on hold, Neil. I'm going to have to put you on hold, Jeremy. God's attentive to our prayers at all times no matter where we are. And you'll get God's attention when you're living holy, and you'll get God's attention when you're struggling, but you still have faith. You'll get God's attention because his ears are attentive to hear you. Did you know that God sees where you are right now? Did you know there are angels surrounding this building and over us right this second? And if there is a dire need, that that angel will immediately report back to the Father and say, we've got to do something right now. I want you to think about that. Whatever you brought with you today, God is able to handle. God is interested in your life. There are some of you who are having financial problems right now, and God is attentive to that need. There are others who are hurting in your body while you've been sitting here. There's some of us, we might can hardly stay awake, and we're thinking, boy, I'll be glad when this is over. And another person across the across the church may be sitting there saying, I don't have any trouble at all paying attention to what the pastor's saying. I just wish I didn't have pain. I just wish I wouldn't hurt. There are others who your thoughts uh, get jumbled up and maybe you've got some type of issue uh, medically and you say, man, I wish I could just remember what's being spoken from the pulpit. I have trouble focusing. I get distracted real easy. There are probably people in here like that. 
But I want you to know that no matter what perspective you're seeing this message from and seeing God from, that God's attentive to you. And that he loves you so much. I can't put it into English how much God loves you. And he wants you to be close to him. and He wants you to feel comfortable talking to him all the time. Because he's waiting to hear from you every morning. I want you to stand with me as we pray. Please remain in the sanctuary. We're going to go ahead and cut all those lights on all the way. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and ask that. Matter of fact, I, I don't want you to depend on me to pray and you just stand there and listen. I want you to take this as an opportunity to, to communicate with the God of heaven. He is attentive to your prayers. Richard Jeffers, he's waiting for me to say, let's pray so that Richard Jeffers gets, so that you get a chance to talk to him. He's waiting on me, the pastor, to say, all right, church, let's go to the Lord in prayer so that he can hear from Lori Miller. Isn't that amazing? So let's do that for just a moment. Nothing specific. Let's just talk to him. Amen. Let's go ahead. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We recognize you are sovereign. You are holy.